everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. We are about to head out for LTX, for Linus Tech Expo, which will have more or less every uh, tech YouTube creator in the space. So we'll have a lot of cool videos with those guys. Roman Derbauer will be there, so we'll do some videos with him as well. But we have some news to go through first, like following up on our overclocking efforts with the 3900X, we ended up doing 5.2 gigahertz without too much trouble, except the performance is a bit weird. So we'll talk briefly about that because we postponed the content as a result of the weird performance. We have uh, news on a CCX overclocking tool, Silicon Lottery binning the Ryzen 3000 series and addressing the future of its business model, and then some other news from the industry. So the first quick news item for this one is our new shirt on store.gamersnexus.net. This is the GN wireframe logo. It's a, it looks pretty 3D, which is actually awesome because of the foil. So it's got foil silver and blue. It's at a slight angle. It was made in Blender actually, which we use as a benchmark for CPUs, as many of you know. On the back, it has uh, polygon shards as well, just for some, some polygon rain. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, so you can pick that up on store.cameronsexus.net if you want. This is going to be one of our limited foil shirts. So once they're gone, they're gone. That'll be it. And uh, this is designed by Andrew, who works on the team. And the shirt itself is a it's custom made. So we custom sized and made uh, the cotton shirts for the foil ones that we do. And if you bought one of the previous ones, it's the same shirt. It's just a new design. So you can pick that up on the store. And it is a limited run. And one final note on that too, the, the shirt is a great way to support us. So if you like what we do and you want to get something in return for your money, you can pick that up and help us out along the way. So let's get into it. 5.2 gigahertz, 3900X. This is by no means a record. We've talked about higher numbers than this from actual pro overclockers. But as for what we've been able to do, uh, we did manage to hit 5.2. We had that stream where we were stuck at 4.9 for a long time. And so the trick was, we ended up doing, uh, we spoke with a few people, Joe Stepanzi, one of them, some people at AMD as, as another source. And what we've learned is that booting at a lower frequency helps the most. So we set the voltages in BIOS and then boot at 4.5 on the 3900X. This is all with liquid nitrogen, of course. And then uh, we get into Windows and use Ryzen Master to go up to whatever frequency we want to get to. And that seems to be much more stable. We also have been using VDDG, which is a voltage we were not even aware of during the stream. And setting that to 1175, 1125, 1175 range seems to help with uh, stability of the performance. And it's one of those things where we're not sure if you probably shouldn't mess with these things unless you're doing competitive overclocking, at least definitely not pushing the voltages as high as we are. because. And we're running like 1.65 volts for vCore, which is obviously unsafe. But that's not really the point of what we're doing. So yeah, that, that's our result. Cinebench sits somewhere in the range of 3950 to almost 4,000 points. For R15, we pushed memory just to 3800CL15, I think was the last stable that we tried on memory. Uh, and then we need to switch out kits for something better to push a bit harder than that. F clock, so the infinity fabric clock is really important for this. It seems like as you push beyond five gigahertz on these CPUs, you have to drop F clock. Um, so dropping to 1467 helped a lot with stability. It does bring down performance a bit, but then you overclock the memory to make up for it. So it's, there's some give and take in here, and it's a really interesting processor to overclock. It's kind of challenging uh, from the start. Like there's a lot to learn. It'll get easier as people figure out how they behave. But anyway, we were pushing to get a content piece out on that or a stream before leaving for LTX, but the performance numbers outside of Cinebench look odd, to say the least. So in some tests, we were getting the same performance as a 4.3 gigahertz all core on the 3900X, which seems like everything about that seems wrong, unless dropping F clock really hurt it that much. But that seems unlikely because we also pushed the memory. Uh, and in other tests, we see improvements, like from 4.3 all core from stock, we're seeing an improvement of maybe 5 to 8% in gaming workloads at 5.0 uh, to 5.2 gigahertz. But that's still not really what we were expecting. So at this point, you know, we wanted to do the video anyway, because we did all the work. It's there. The, the data is like, it's accurate insofar as the way it was tested, it was accurate. But we don't feel like it's correct, if that makes sense. So at this point, what we're thinking is postpone the content to get it right. Well, I think we have gotten it right so far, but I think 
I think there's a better, I think it's misrepresentative of the actual performance. I'm not sure why. So our current theory is that it might be something to do with motherboards. We're gonna switch to the godlike from the master when we get back from LTX and see if that improves those numbers to an area where it makes sense. But anyway, that's kind of our overclocking adventures with the 3900X. We have really cool content planned around it. It's just the, the numbers have to look like they actually make sense. And if these are going to be the final numbers, then well, I guess in the meantime, we'll talk to some uh, people at AMD and see if, if maybe they could better understand why we're seeing such performance degradation or in kind of best cases, only a couple percent gains over stock um, for, for non-Cinebench workloads is really the question. Even Premiere and Blender were kind of weird. Anyway, uh, CCX overclocking tool, but you have to be careful. So uh, former EVGA employee Shimino, and also pretty sure works at ASUS currently, uh, released his updated work tool for per CCX overclocking. This is something that's been in the news a little bit. You can already sort of do individualized CCD and CCX overclocking with any of these built-in tools. So through BIOS, you can force one CCD mode if you wanted to. This is more for competitive overclocking. You shouldn't really turn off half your CPU for daily use. But uh, you can do one CCD mode. You can go into Ryzen Master and get per core overclocking pretty easily, standard stuff. You can also use Work Tool, which is what Shimino put out. And Shimino is also a, he's a world record holder. He's uh, been in the industry a long time. So a good source for stuff. But Work Tool, basically it's supposed to break the fit limits, the FIT, so it's like a silicon fitness. It's a qualification of the silicon's health. So it breaks that limiter, and then you're able to do per CCX overclocking uh, to trick Ryzen CPUs into running tighter overclocks per CCX and get some more frequency out of the better of the, of the CCXs that you have. So the Stilt, who's another well-known uh, poster on forums and does a lot of the deep dives on new architectures when they come out, the Stilt pointed out that this tool can kill CPUs, said that it's dangerous for the public to use, and uh, offered a lot of hesitation on it. So basically said there's some important steps to follow for using this, if you skip some of those, you can easily kill the CPU. If you leave auto voltage, if you set the wrong voltage, or if you use offset voltages, you'll kill it, or you'll degrade it, and you might not know for a little while. Um, so we won't directly link the tool below. You can go find it if you want to use it. Uh, this is more of something for competitive overclocking at this point, or careful overclocking, and follow all of the advice for work tool itself. It's on the thread where it's posted publicly, and also check the stilts post and just be careful with it because if you're not doing competitive overclocking, there's barely any real reason to overclock to begin with on Ryzen at all. AMD more or less killed overclocking. Uh, so, and that's not, we're not saying that's a bad thing. It's just, that's how these CPUs are. So be careful, but the tool is out there if you want to have some fun with it. Uh, speaking of overclocking and AMD, Silicon Lottery, the company that bins CPUs and sells the higher clocking ones, uh, for a bit of a premium, which is fair for the work they do, recently posted its Ryzen 3000 bin selection and also had something of an existential consideration. So what we know now is that the binning and the overclocks from Silicon Lottery on their website, siliconlottery.com, confirms what almost all the reviewers have already seen. Limited headroom for manual overclocking. Robert Halleck, AMD's senior technical marketing manager, even said as much in a Reddit thread while discussing Ryzen's boost clock behavior. Silicon Lottery took to Reddit to discuss its findings with Ryzen 3000 binnings, as well as offering praise for AMD and musing on the future of Silicon Lottery's business model in its current form. Quote, AMD has done a fantastic job here overall, and we're very aware this is the start to the end of our company in general. As both AMD and Intel optimize their binning process more and more, overclocking will not be possible as CPUs will boost themselves on their own to the highest clocks possible and Silicon Lottery uh, will surely be around for a few CPU generations yet, but here's hoping that the company can find a way to pivot and remain in business in the enthusiast space. Because we've spoken with, uh, with the people at Silicon Lottery, and we like what they do. So it's, it's competent people, they have good intentions, they've got an interesting business model, and they cater to the enthusiast crowd. So hopefully Silicon Lottery can uh, find something else that it can bin, maybe GPUs. <laughs> Uh, in the space and, and stick around for a while. But that's the news. They do have stuff listed on Ryzen 3000 if you want to buy it, although it's a bit more limited than what you would see on the previous Intel CPUs, for example.
There's a new report from Gartner, the think tank, and it's predicting a global year-over-year -year decline for semiconductor revenue to the tune of 9.6%. Global semiconductor revenue is expected to total $429 billion for 2019, compared to $475 billion in 2018, marking its sharpest decline since 2009. A quote here says, the semiconductor market is being impacted by a number of factors, a weaker pricing environment for memory and some other chip types, combined with the U.S.-China trade dispute and lower growth in major applications, including smartphones, servers, and PCs. This is driving the global semiconductor market to its lowest growth since 2009. And that was explained by Ben Lee, the senior principal research analyst at Gartner. Gartner is also forecasting a DRAM price decline of 42.1% for 2019 due to a demand-driven oversupply that is expected to hang around all the way through the second half of 2020. Gartner notes the DRAM oversupply is in part due to weak demand from hyperscale data centers and is accentuated by gluttonous inventories of DRAM vendors. The ongoing dispute between the U.S. and China, which recently let up a bit, is expected to have a long-term effect on semiconductor revenue as well as supply and demand. The tensions between the U.S. and Chinese economies will accelerate China's domestic semiconductor production and spur local forks of the ARM processors. See Huawei as an example. AMD's Mark Papermaster has stated via the AMD blog that the company has joined the Compute Express Link, or CXL, consortium. And CXL is an open source, high bandwidth interconnect that's based on PCIe Gen 5. And it's supposed to offer lower latency and tighter coherency for heterogeneous processing. So with the announcement, AMD now supports all of the current and upcoming interconnects. That would include CXL as one of them, CCIX, Open CAPI and Gen Z. The CXL initiative was started by Intel initially, but it also boasts founding members like Microsoft, Google, Dell, uh, EMC, no surprise, part of Dell, and Facebook. And the consortium now includes 55 members in total and is becoming one of the fastest growing interconnect solutions, with AMD being the newest. That Toshiba and Western Digital power outage we talked about previously looks like it's going to lead to a NAND and DRAM price hike in some ways, but then we've got the oversupply on the other part of the market, counterbalancing it a bit. So the June power outage in Japan affected both Toshiba and Western Digital, and it led to the loss of a lot of NAND, as we discussed previously, a flash. The power outage disrupted production at several fabrication plants. This is affecting the pricing. It led to several exabytes of memory being affected and potentially lost. And the news of the price hikes comes via DRAM exchange. So as DRAM Exchange points out, there's also some political interposition at play here. According to DRAM Exchange, the Japanese government announced that, quote, it will be controlling South Korea-bound exports of three key materials used in the manufacturing of semiconductors, smartphones, and panels, causing module manufacturers in the memory industry downstream to give higher quotes. DRAM Exchange and TrendForce seem to believe any serious reversal in supply and demand for DRAM, uh, the DRAM market is slim, given the continued downward slide of DRAM prices and overall weak demand. NAND is expected to be more affected, though, with short-term price increases beginning this month. However, prices are only expected to be affected in the near term. DRAM Exchange and TrendForce both believe any price increase will be resolved in the long term. TSMC has had a really strong forward pace over the past, well, couple of months that we've been doing the news updates. Uh, and that forward pace is continuing unabated as TSMC is now moving forward with its N3 and N5 production. So this was in an earnings call where TSMC said that the company's N3 and N5 are progressing according to plan. TSMC has already engaged early customers with its N3 process. Regarding N5, TSMC is expecting an 80% increase in logic density and a 15% performance uplift compared to N7. TSMC is expected to enter volume production with N5 uh, in the second half of 2020. And TSMC was less revealing with its N3 process, only saying, quote, on N3, the technology development progress is going well. And we are already engaging with early customers on the technology definition. We expect our three nanometer technology to further extend our leadership position well into the future. TSMC also mentioned the ramp up of its N7 process and that its N7 Plus process, the company's first that adapts EUV for certain layers, is entering volume production this year. So adoption of EUV is increasing now. Uh, this is something that's been discussed for decades at this point. It's, it's um, not easy to do. Uh, lithography, as it turns out, very challenging. So EUV getting more spread in the market as we've discussed the last 
couple of months now. And for the last one, Origin. Origin is celebrating its 10th year anniversary with the big O, 2.0, really, guys. The build combines a gaming PC and Xbox One, a PlayStation 4, and a Nintendo Switch in one chassis. It's a hybrid one-off build that won't go on sale and represents a throwback to 2009's Big O 1.0 that integrated in Xbox 360. So, uh, other than Origin having the worst marketing possible, there's other news involving Origin, and that it's they were sold to Corsair. So hopefully, uh, marketing choices like naming your anniversary event Big O because haha -ha, Origin will go away. That's that's the hope with the Corsair acquisition. Anyway. Corsair is buying Origin. Uh, Corsair has been working on its own pre-built PCs for a while now with the small form factor ones, those mini ITX boxes that they've been building with pretty much all Corsair components. The Corsair makes everything except for, what, CPUs, GPUs, obviously, they'll never make those. My two add-in boards at some point, they've kind of done them with MSI, and they don't make motherboards. But the rest of the components in the system, Corsair makes. So now, Corsair's acquired a PC building company, an SI, and with that acquisition, we'll have the ability to just completely assemble the PCs, probably with a bit tighter margins than Origin was able to since it bought the components from manufacturers like Corsair to begin with. And that puts Corsair in more direct competition with NZXT and its BLD solution. Corsair will also offer IQ software integration on Origin PCs, which is really not a surprise at all, and will extend its mentally announced Hydro X open loop liquid cooling solution for future PC builds. The collaborations otherwise are TBA. There's a press release that talks a bit about it, but that's all we really have right now. Origin PC at the moment will continue to operate as a separate brand under Corsair, but whether or not it's renamed to something like Corsair PCs uh, remains to be seen once Corsair goes through the whole business of origin. So that's it for this one. As always, you can subscribe for more. You go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up our new wireframe shirt design if you want to support us. And that is up already. So it's on the store, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Otherwise, we'll see you at LTX. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.